Johnson, and I'm a senior at Meredith College, and I'm a history major, and I'm double minoring in Spanish and public history. I am Marissa Fowler. I'm a senior at Meredith College. I'm a history major, and I'm minoring in English, communication, and family and consumer science. We've both studied women's history at Meredith in various ways. So, in preparation for the centennial celebration of the 19th Amendment, we did some research and we looked at primary sources from women's colleges in North Carolina, like Meredith, produced during the time of the movement to see what their involvement in the suffrage movement looked like. Tell us more about the suffrage movement, Marissa. The suffrage movement sort of initially began with the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, which involved many notable women coming together. And part of this convention, they wrote a document called the Declaration of Sentiments, which was just advocating for all the rights that they felt women needed. And part of this was the right to vote. So this suffrage movement developed from here. So it was a very slow-moving movement. There were two types of suffrage organizations. One that was more polite and worked more in smaller uh, demonstrations, parades that weren't as overtly political. And this was the National American Woman's Suffrage Association. And there was a secondary group, the National Woman's Party, that was famous for its militant strategies, including picketing at the White House. But this wasn't until much later. By 1890, most states had some kind of limited suffrage for women, mostly in their domestic realm, so they might be able to vote for the school board or things like that. But it wasn't until much later that women actually had more power in voting. And the amendment did not pass through the House of Representatives and the Senate until 1919. So that was about 70 years after the initial push for suffrage. And then the ratification process was quite slow. It was difficult to find a 36 state to ratify the amendment that was needed. And it was eventually secured by a young senator in Tennessee in August of 1920. North Carolina was not one of those 36 states no. to ratify the amendment. To learn more about the suffrage movement in North Carolina, we talked to Raylana Poteet, a curator at the North Carolina Museum of History. Hi, my name is Raylana Poteet, and I'm the curator of political and social history at the North Carolina Museum of History. So we would like to begin our interview by asking you, through all the research you've done about suffrage in North Carolina, what made the movement unique in the state compared to the nation as a whole? That's a great question. Uh, I would say there are two things that pop out when I'm talking about suffrage. One, of course, is that it didn't succeed here. Um, so North Carolina is one of the states that did not ratify the 19th Amendment. So after all the hard work that women and men put into the movement here um, for several long years, uh, the legislature still did not ratify it. And so I think a lot of people are find that story interesting, and especially when you go through and go, well, we were one of the possibilities to be the final one, the 36th and final state, and we were looking at it at the same time as Tennessee, and then you find out that there are legislators who contacted Tennessee, uh, 63 of the members of the House of Representatives sent something saying, hey, if you don't ratify, that would be great, and please don't force it on us, we're not going to do it, and... Um, you, knowing that they did that and that the Senate voted to postpone and not even consider it, and then that the House voted the day after Tennessee had already ratified it, still not to ratify, um, I think that kind of gives people pause and they just go, oh, okay, um, that's something different going on here. Uh, and then the other thing, of course, is that North Carolina was a southern state and the South was the area that was least likely to support suffrage because of the tied to white supremacy. They were afraid that if you open the question of who could vote, that would open the question of how states were limiting the franchise of African-American men. Uh, there were some people who were worried that African-American women might be able to pass some of the um, restrictions that were based on education when you would go to register. And so there was a, a lot of fear in the South and in North Carolina that women's suffrage would 
uh, open the, they called it sometimes the race issue or the race, race uh, problem. And so the difference here, I think, is in particular that there were a few people who really wanted it, but we don't really know what the vast majority of people felt. Uh, but there were plenty of people who were anti-suffragists or who just didn't seem to care that much about it. So the movement that you think of as this grand, glorious picketing the White House and go going on parades and marches, that really wasn't happening here. It was a lot more behind the scenes, people writing letters, people lobbying their legislators, but not the active visual stuff that we think of for suffrage. So I think you kind of covered this in that answer you just gave, but why do you think North Carolina was slower to accept the movement? Well, not just slower. North Carolina was the last state to form a statewide suffrage league, uh, at least in the, the 20th century. We had one late 1890s, and it petered out pretty quickly. But 1913, before we have a state league here, there's various theories on why that is. A lot of it is just that we were a very conservative state. The South in general was later to the movement. We were just the last state to it. I think the women here, the prominent women here who were involved let me step back, the prominent white women, wealthy white women here who were involved in the movement, uh, very much thought that they could just ask and that their men would sort of chivalrously give them suffrage. And you have women here coming out after the National Women's Party is picketing in Washington and is a much more active, sort of they would call it a militant movement. There were women here who would come out in the newspaper. They would send out press releases distancing themselves from that. So they, they really didn't want anybody to think that they were going to protest or that they were going to, you know, in any active way, um, cause problems. They had just a much different approach here. And, uh, and why that was so in the South makes sense, why it was so in North Carolina in particular. I just think it was women here weren't used to doing that kind of thing. So what do you think inspired the people of North Carolina especially women, to finally become involved in the movement? Well, you see sort of a slow, gradual increase in people who are willing to call themselves suffragists. At first, um, in the words of one of the state legislators, it was just a few active, agitating white women. Um, but over time, especially by the time you get to World War I, you have more women who've been exposed to it. You have more women who are exposed at um, university here. Um, Meredith and uh, what is now UNCG were you know prime areas where people found out about it when women went to school there. So you find you know particularly at universities and colleges um, citizenship schools that are happening where uh, in many cases former suffragists are teaching them uh, so that women can learn about how government works, how they vote, and all kinds of you know ways to prepare them for citizenship, which is kind of interesting. Uh, you have people who were involved in war work and or women who are involved in war work, and suffrage leagues who specifically called themselves suffragists while doing the war work so that the PR got out that, you know, people who supported suffrage were, you know, good, solid American citizens. Uh, and so you had people who were gradually won over to the cause because they saw what good work women were doing. Um, I think in general, just the more people talked about it, the it was less of a foreign idea. By the time that the amendment is being voted on, there is a sense of inevitability and you see arguments going back and forth that, oh, it's inevitable, it's going to happen, we should support it anyway. And by this time, it was part of the planks for the Republican and the Democratic parties nationally. But then you have other people going, why should we support it? Just because it's inevitable. So it was a, a, a gradual increase just as people became more aware of it um, and as it became more accepted throughout the country. So you've kind of already touched on this as well, but who was excluded from the discussion of suffrage in the state or who would benefit from suffrage? Well, it is important to remember that when we're talking about suffrage in the 1920s, we are only talking about white women in the South uh, and in other parts of the country, but specifically in the South, where you have states that are disenfranchising African-American men. Uh, their intent is to disenfranchise African-American women, too. I think one of the things that people will find interesting about this is that we tend to think of women and suffragists as sort of the good guys in this fight um, because of where we stand today. Um, but looking back, there are statements that we would consider incredibly racist today coming from both the anti-suffragists and the suffragists. Um, you have suffragists, uh, women and men, who are you know openly coming out and saying, don't worry, this is not a race issue. It's not going to cause problems because we'll be able to still disenfranchise 
African-American women the same way that we disenfranchise African-American men through poll taxes, literacy tests, whatever. Uh, you also have another strain that says, don't worry, there are more white women in the state than there are African-American women. So even if any of them are able to pass those tests and vote, we will still be able to outvote them. Very, very openly talking about it. Um, and so people of color did not really gain the vote in 1920. There's an ongoing struggle all the way through the Voting Rights Act of 1965 for those people to be able to vote as well and to have a much wider real suffrage. Um, there were African-American women who were suffragists and who were actively involved in fighting for suffrage. They tended to be people who lived in the North. There's only a very few in North Carolina that we know of who were in favor of it, and it's very hard to find you know, statements about that and anything in the historical record about that. Um, it was easier if you didn't leave, live in the South to be more open about it. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, would you tell us about the museum's exhibit on suffrage? Sure. We have a great exhibit in our lobby, and it is called You Have to Start a Thing. It's from a quote by Lillian Exum Clement, who was the first female state legislator in North Carolina. Uh, she said something along the lines of, I know that someday there will be more women in politics, but you have to start a thing, when she was uh, in the General Assembly in the early 1920s. Uh, the exhibit has a little bit about the overall women's suffrage movement, you know, talking about all those people we associate nationally with it and how the national movement worked. And then we have the central part of it focusing on North Carolina and how North Carolina was different and what was going on here. And then the last third of it focuses on what happened after women got the right to vote uh, or what happened after only white women got the right to vote and how long it took. For everyone to have that right, um, we touch on a few things like the ERA and how North Carolina, very similarly to the 19th Amendment, also never passed the ERA Amendment. Uh, and we have a little bit about women in politics and how long it took in North Carolina. Um, women gained the vote in 1920, but it is 1996 before the first woman is elected to a statewide office in North Carolina. So we kind of touch on all those things. We have some fun things interactives in it where you can spin a wheel to figure out if you would have been able to vote at certain times in our state's past. We've got some great videos with actors who are doing lines from uh, speeches, propaganda, newspaper articles from the time. So you can kind of hear a statement from a suff and then a statement from an ante and then a statement from a suff and a statement from an ante. Uh, and then we also have um, a voting interactive where you can vote on potential amendments and get to see your vote tallied along with everybody else who's come through. So, uh, And a, a fun photo op where you can take a picture um, in front of women working in an office, because that's one of our points, is that that's how suffrage worked a lot more in North Carolina. We don't have any great images of North Carolinians parading or picketing for suffrage, uh, but we do have an image of the North Carolina Equal Suffrage Association offices where they are sitting there writing letters. So um, it's going to be a fun exhibit, and I hope everyone can come see it. So we've just had our interview with Ray. We've mm -hmm. learned a lot about the suffrage movement in North Carolina specifically, but our research was on women's colleges in North Carolina. We go to a women's college, and so we learned that in our research that a lot of these women's colleges were religiously affiliated, and we wondered maybe if that played any role in their involvement in the suffrage movement. And you did a lot of research on this religious affiliation. Mm -hmm. So what can you tell us about that? Well, first of all, um, it was natural for religious institutions to head up the establishment of colleges and universities because they were encouraging their followers to become more educated so that they could understand their faith and sort of spread that message to others. So naturally, we had a lot of different denominations in North Carolina, and individually, they established these institutions of higher learning for women, too. So Meredith College was established by the Southern Baptists. Salem was established by the Moravians. Peace College, which is now William Peace University, was established by the Presbyterians. And we only had one women's college that was not religiously affiliated, and that was the State Normal and Industrial College, which was a public university, and so it was not affiliated. Um, and what we found was that these schools were very much 
in line with the values of the denominations they were affiliated with. Oftentimes, the students had to attend chapel every day. For example, there were specific guidelines and codes about their behavior that they had to follow. Mm -hmm. Wardrobe, too. Yes, wardrobe, how they could go out outside of campus, what they could be doing. But what we also saw was that these um, denominations did not release a specific statement about suffrage. There was no, oh, you have to support suffrage as mm-hmm. this, or us, the Moravians, support suffrage. Right. So because of that, there was no clear guideline for the students to follow based on their faith, and they had to instead make personal decisions on what they believed. So these four schools that we're talking about, they weren't the only women's colleges in the state at the time, but they were sort of the biggest ones. They were the main players. Mm -hmm. All of these schools were segregated. Mm -hmm. So if we wanted to look at women of color um, that went to women's colleges, that was a little bit difficult. Um, Bennett was sort of the first school that comes to mind, but they did not, Bennett was not a women's college until... 1926. Yes. So which was after the suffrage movement. Exactly. Um, Outside of our school. Yes. Um, and some of these schools aren't women's colleges anymore. Right. There Pieces were co-ed. about a dozen or more women's colleges at the time of the movement, but since they've either closed down mm-hmm. or they've become co-ed. So from our research, these denominations didn't. They didn't make a formal statement on support or not supporting suffrage. And so we sort of determined that if a student was going to support or not support suffrage was based on her own opinions and not necessarily Mm -hmm. that of the denomination that this school was affiliated with, even though we did find evidence that um, the denomination of the school did really play a role in day-to-day life for students. And we could see this, too, because we looked at the state normal, which, of course, was not a religious institution and for example Meredith which had similar levels of suffrage activity so just going off their religious affiliation there was no correlation there. Mm -hmm. Still important to talk about though Mm because it was important to the school it's just maybe not important to the suffrage movement. Right. Letter from an alumna of the class of 1904 in the Meredith College Acorn. I found women in Colorado had accomplished much good with the right to vote. I think most women could vote as intelligently as a man who I knew, who said he went to the primaries to vote. He did not know the various candidates for office, so he looked down at the list, picked out the name he liked the best, and affixed his cross there too. I dare say almost any woman could vote as intelligently as that, even if she relied solely upon her instinct to determine the name selected. I have not found the home influence altered nor different here from what we find in places where women do not vote. I am able heartily to endorse the movement. I have been able to see clearly the good results women have obtained in making Fort Collins a model hometown. Now that we know a little bit more about women's colleges, what did the suffrage movement look like at these schools? In our research, one thing we noticed was that most of these women's colleges, if not all of them, had a very uh, prominent presence of literary societies on campus, and these organizations were often the mm, largest organizations on campus. Yes. What did they have to do with suffrage? Well, the literary organizations were very popular during the progressive era for women to join, Um, and what we saw was that of all the women's colleges we studied, pretty much all of them had two literary societies, and all the students were involved in one of them. So half the student body was in one, half the student body was in the other. And it made a lot of sense for these societies to have a yearly or semester debate. And the students prepared for quite some time on these debates. They were big deals. The whole campus went to them. Um, And what we saw was that in the early years of the movement within North Carolina, that is, these societies often debated about women's suffrage. So between 1910 and 1913, at Meredith, the state normal, and peace, there was at least one debate at each campus. 
Um, and oftentimes those were in consecutive years. So you can tell it was a very controversial and important topic to the students. It's true that the positive or pro-suffrage argument never won, but that was because these debates were based on argumentation and not political beliefs. However, the debates did allow the students to both learn about suffrage and argue about such an important topic. So it gave them a voice and political power that they didn't necessarily have. And through doing all the research and preparing for it, they were learning a lot about how suffrage looked in other places and how it could look for them. So Morgan, Mm -hmm. along with the literary societies, what other types of organizations and clubs were on these women's college campuses that had to do with political activities and suffrage? Right. Meredith was the only school that we found evidence of having organizations that were directly suffrage related. Meredith had the Equal Rights for Women Club, which we found in the 1914 to 15 yearbook. And then a few years later, Meredith College had an Equal Suffrage League from 1917 to 1918. And that was one of the largest organizations on campus that we noticed in the time periods that we were looking at other than the literary societies. So the Equal Suffrage League had over 75 members, which uh, Meredith wasn't very large at that time. So that is a considerable number of students and shows that a lot of students were interested in suffrage and even supported suffrage. So Meredith was the only school that had organizations directly related to suffrage. State Normal had a miscellany club which uh, its purpose was to keep students informed on current political topics. And we found that in 1912, uh, suffrage was actually one of the topics that they talked about. So that's pretty early in the movement, especially for North Carolina, and shows that students were aware of suffrage and were talking about it that early. So apart from clubs... uh, Traditions are very important at women's colleges. We know that going to Meredith now. And traditions were just as important in the early 1900s as well. And so we found suffrage being integrated into traditions on campus. In the mid-19-teens, the State Normal had an annual gala night. And at the gala night in 1915, we found out that they had skit about political and historical movements and one of the movements included women's suffrage. Skits we found were a common way that these schools integrated suffrage into traditions. So at Meredith in 1915 as well, the junior stunt skit, which stunts still exist at Meredith today, it's like a field day in the spring. Uh, 1915, the junior skunt stunt skit was a parody of the suffrage issue in which legislators were debating man suffrage instead of woman suffrage. And they sort of played on all of the arguments made against women's suffrage, but made it about men instead. So that was an interesting find. I mean, though those traditions on campus did have some incorporation of political themes like suffrage There were other events on campuses that specifically existed just to promote suffrage. In 1915, the same year as these skits, we also saw that the state normal had a suffrage march through the campus that included the participation of over 250 students. There were stump speeches and large banners, and it was according to a college student, full of fun, but at the same time convincing towards the argument of suffrage. So that was showing how the movement was really growing within these campuses. Another political event that we saw was at Meredith College. Between 1912 and 1920, they actually had uh, mock elections every presidential election cycle. And these really grew from just having 
a ballot for a preferred candidate to, in 1920, going as far as women pretending to be the presidential candidates, giving speeches that they thought they would give, and then voting for the ones who aligned most with their political views. And this just showed that even before women were officially able to vote, they were still casting their vote at these women's colleges. Now, obviously, we can't ignore the fact that maybe not everyone on campus supported suffrage. We didn't necessarily find a lot in terms of students actively being against suffrage, speaking out against it, creating organizations against it. Definitely not in the same way that we saw students uh, participating in support of suffrage. But we did find that students sometimes didn't want to be closely associated with the movement or maybe were afraid to be seen as militant suffragists, angry suffragists. One example of this that we found was in the 1913 yearbook where the senior class denied that their class motto which was a woman can lead had anything to do with suffrage and they said that quote our motto has been taken for that of a woman suffrage league however we do not stand either for that or suffering women so this is just an example of how students were afraid to directly associate themselves with the movement We also have an example from State Normal. We found a short story in the college's magazine. And in this story, women had the right to vote and they're at the polls and they're voting. And then a hat goes on sale and they flee the polls and run to go buy a hat. And so students were aware of these sort of stereotypes about women, how they weren't going to be able to take the vote seriously. Um, So all of these examples that we've found of dealing with the suffrage question through humor sort of shows how students uh, at women's colleges were maybe not taking the issue as seriously as other women during the time period. So one group on campus that we haven't really talked about yet is faculty. So were faculty supportive of suffrage? Well, this is interesting because this is one of the factors we looked at when we were trying to understand why some colleges were more involved in the movement than others. So we began to look at faculty to see if any of the colleges had uh, members of the faculty who were very involved in the movement and sort of would have guided the students to also participating in the movement. So what we found, interestingly enough, that Salem College, which was our outlier in the movement as far as not being involved, actually had many faculty members who established an Equal Suffrage League in 1913, which is one of the first leagues in the state. But uh, it was shut down by the Board of Trustees, who did not want faculty to be affiliated with political opinions like that. So as a result, there was no more suffrage activity on that campus until after the period we were studying, so after the amendment was ratified. Unlike at Salem, Meredith had an influential suffragist in their campus physician, Dr. Delia Dixon Carroll, who was very close with the students and encouraged them to become more active politically. And Peace actually had a petition in 1918 to the state legislator, and this was signed by their president, their dean, and a large number of the faculty. So obviously there, the faculty was very confident in their support and was open in their political beliefs. And at the state normal, what we saw was that there were several notable suffragists, including Walter Clinton Jackson, Gertrude Mendenhall, Mary Petty, Annie Petty, and Harriet Elliott. And what was most important here is that their faculty were so involved in the movement that they had close connections to some of the most notable suffragists in the country. So they were able to bring guest speakers to campus like Dr. Anna Howard Shaw, who were instrumental in guiding students to understanding the suffrage movement and supporting it. 
Meredith College's President Richard Tillman Vann's Baccalaureate Speech, 1912. Have you not marked the broader and more strenuous demand for women's suffrage in recent years? I do not mention this to approve or condemn. I am simply dealing with the facts and not attempting any propaganda. Whether women should vote, I do not know. But two things may be taken for granted. They will vote when the majority of them wish to do so, and the trend of sentiment now is strongly in that direction. It would not be surprising if you should be called on to exercise the franchise ere you have passed your prime. But let me pause to say that whenever women do enter the domain of full citizenship, they will enter on the invitation of their brothers and because they are counted worthy. But voting aside, the broader and closer relation of the individual to government and the dominant influence of women in shaping the individual lay on them the duty of considering seriously how might they count for most in creating the highest type of citizenship. As we could hear from Meredith College's President Van in his baccalaureate speech in 1912, there was a widespread feeling of inevitability both within women's colleges and across the nation. Along with this, we saw an increase in participation and support for the movement as the years passed, as the idea of suffrage became more accepted or at least tolerated within both men and women. There was also a growing recognition that the values the nation were built upon were ultimately supported expanded rights for women, leading to criticism of language that were used in official documents like the Declaration of Independence. And this is, of course, an idea that we saw first used by the suffragists in the Seneca Falls Convention way back at the beginning of the movement. So around 70 years later, this idea was embraced on a large scale. And this did reflect that inevitability and practicality that women should be full citizens in this democracy. So people knew women were going to get the right to vote. And so we saw in our research a lot of student writings that focused on women being prepared to vote. We found a piece from the State Normal in 1913 from their on campus magazine that encouraged students to form their own ideas and not just follow their father's politics, which was a common stereotype or misconception about what women were going to do with the vote. And similarly, we saw in a piece from Meredith that students were encouraging each other to make time every day to become informed, read about the news, make your own political opinions. So before the amendment was passed, we have these writings from students encouraging their peers to be informed citizens, keeping in mind that women were probably going to have the vote in a few years. And then after the amendment was passed, uh, students continue to encourage each other to use their newfound right to vote in the most positive way possible. So in a November 1920 issue of State Normals magazine, we found a guide that students wrote to tell each other how they should use their new political ability. And we also found in our research that students emphasize, especially after the amendment was ratified and they had the right to vote, they emphasize the need for women to pursue those womanly causes, such as child care and education. And these were issues that women had been involved with before the 19th Amendment was passed, but now they could finally formally vote on these issues, vote for politicians who cared about these issues as much as they did. And so through all these writings that we found that students used to encourage each other to use their right to vote in a positive way. We could see that they really just recognized the new power that they had and they appreciated the significance of what the amendment was doing for them. So important to note, white supremacy was an important aspect of certain women's argument for wanting the right to vote. And while we didn't necessarily find those types of suffrage arguments in our research, 
there was evidence of white supremacy on these campuses. Um, At Meredith, Chief Justice Walter Clark came to speak at Meredith during the suffrage movement um, to talk about women's roles. It is important to note that Walter Clark was a known white supremacist. Chief Justice Walter Clark was both a known white supremacist and also given the title of North Carolina's first male suffragist. And he spoke all across the state to share his message on how it would help the white people of the state Mm -hmm. if women were able to vote. Women's rights are multifaceted. It's not just, okay, women have the right to vote and everything's fine now. There's always, especially in the early 1900s, there's always another side to it. And that's important to talk about. Our new responsibility, the quarry from State Normal and Industrial School, November 1920. The Susan B. Anthony Amendment, ratified by the state of Tennessee. Full citizenship for women. Such were the headlines on the front pages of thousands of our dailies on that memorable day of the ratification. Full citizenship for women. What a thrill of joy did those words send to the hearts of the tired suffrage workers. Everywhere, women squared their shoulders, looked men straight in the eye, and said, My new freedom makes me your political equal. Congratulations on your new freedom, said the man, but what of your new responsibility? Yes, the new freedom had brought a new responsibility. And how have women been meeting this responsibility? Well, in various ways. Some women have their right to vote, which is their only method of political expression as a joke or as a novelty, as some new toys in the hands of a playful child. Then there are those who are emphasizing an indifferent attitude. This attitude is characterized by such expressions as these. Oh, I know nothing about politics, and I care less. Let the men run the country. On the other hand, however, there is a group of women who are honestly interested in politics. These women are taking their new responsibility as a sacred privilege and are making the necessary preparations for a successful entrance into the political arena. These are some of the ways in which women are meeting their new responsibility. What, then, is a scientific method of meeting it? In the first place, the jokers, the cynics, the indifferent women, and the serious-minded women must put aside their old, petty animosities and meet each other on a common basis. They must come with open minds, free from any traditional ideas about politics and parties which they may have acquired from their environment. In the second place, women must make a nonpartisan study of citizenship in order to appreciate the merits and understand the faults of the existing political machine. In the third place, after making a careful study of the political system, they must make up their minds as to certain definite policies that they would like to see enforced in our government. Then they should cast their vote with the party whose platform most nearly coincides with their own policies. In order to accomplish these three steps, all women must be serious-minded women. They must read and think as they have never read and thought before, and all of them must go into politics with the determination to make their political step the best thing that they have ever undertaken. The 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920, giving women the right to vote, but that does not end the story of women's activism it was only white and usually middle class and upper women who were able to readily exercise this privilege and women still throughout time have been fighting to get these additional rights we've seen in more recent years uh 70 1970s 1980s the fight for the equal rights amendment which was not added to the Constitution, but recently Virginia became the last state needed to ratify the amendment. And, of course, more recently we've seen the hashtag MeToo movement, which has highlighted the lack of safety and equality that women have in the workplace and the harassment that they continue to face because of their gender and we haven't necessarily seen many legal actions because of this but it's still a 
a developing movement that a lot of women are involved in today. Working on this project has definitely highlighted for us the limitations of studying women's history in general. So in our case, nobody had really done research on women's colleges in North Carolina in relation to the suffrage movement. And so that meant that our research was largely primary source base, and that can be, in a lot of cases, more time-consuming than maybe uh, secondary source research is. And that is especially the case when the only real option you have is primary sources. Another difficulty we faced was that the time frame we were looking at coincided with World War I, and so a lot of the materials that we were looking at from these colleges, like their campus publications, were limited during this time. And so what we were looking for may just not have been published. Mm -hmm. Even if these women were wildly involved in the suffrage movement, we would not have known. That's something to keep in mind this year as we're celebrating women and celebrating this centennial. It's taken a lot of work to even know enough about the movement to celebrate it in this way. It's a little strange to think that women have only had the right to vote for 100 years. Uh, My great-grandmother, who I knew um, and was alive for a lot of my childhood, she was born in 1921. And so she was she was born right after women got the right to vote. And like the thought that the other women in her family couldn't vote and just how close that is to us today. Which is especially important given that this year is an election year. Mm -hmm. And so this is also a reminder for everyone to practice the rights that their ancestors may not have had. Mm -hmm. And that As we've seen through our research, so many people have fought so hard for. So this project would not have been possible without a number of people and organizations, including the Meredith College Undergraduate Research Department, who funded our research during the summer of 2019. We'd also like to thank our Meredith College archivist, Janice Snyker, and Carrie Nichols, as well as the archivist at UNC Greensboro, Scott Henshaw. We would also like to thank Dr. Robbins, who has been our research advisor for this whole project. We worked with some amazing speakers from the Meredith College Theater Department, Laura Austin, Vivian Porch, and Grace Bolton, and we were able to get these speakers through the help of Kathy Rogers. We would also like to thank the North Carolina Museum of History for helping us publish this podcast, specifically BJ Davis and Raylana Poteet.